about four years ago. I told the witch doctor I was in love with you. I told the witch doctor I was in love with you. And then the witch doctor, he told me what to do. And he said, ooh, ee, ooh, ah, ah, bing, bang, palla, walla, bing, bang. Ooh, ee, ooh, ah, ah, bing, bang, palla, walla, bing, bang. I told the witch doctor you didn't love me true. I told the witch doctor you didn't love me nice. And then Amy pinned the paper mache spider to the living room ceiling. Impaled through a toothy skull was a pumpkin spice candle that flung capering shadows across the breakfast bar. A strand of spindly black spiders crawled up the front door frame. A pair of pewter four-foot-tall gargoyles with ruby eyes, holding hollowed skulls full of gummy eyeballs and wax vampire teeth guarded the bathroom door. Shane and Amy lived in the middle of nowhere and wouldn't have one trick-or-treater. But Amy always prepared as if hordes would traverse their bumpy dirt drive. Because Halloween was her favorite holiday. Amy's phone lit up, cackling like an old witch. She checked the message. Hey babe, only 88 in Baghdad today. Probably hot as fuck there, huh? Be home in a few days. Can't wait to see you in Scooter. It had been a year since Shane had been sent to Iraq. She received his first letter about a month after he left. His words sounded content but homesick. Amy had wrote back telling him about Scooter's schooling, Alamo's latest mishap with the polecat living under the shed, Carmen's most recent costumes, and she even told him about the visit she'd made to her Aunt Carol at the Fort Worth Psychiatric Hospital. Vicky invited herself into Amy's head several years after her way too premature death at only 10 years old. Amy was 15 the first time she'd heard Vicky in her head. They had frequent conversations, mostly about Vicky's brother and his downward slant into trouble with a capital T. After two years of listening to Amy talk to seemingly nobody, Amy's mother had her committed. Vicky felt terrible and stopped visiting Amy. Being in the crazy house was bad enough, but to top it off, her best friend had left Amy to weather the insanity all on her own. Amy understood, though. Vicky blamed herself that Amy was locked up, so she kept her distance, hoping if Amy stopped talking to herself, she might be released. At 18, Amy was released, but she had nowhere to go. Living with her mother was not going to happen. Amy couldn't take the chance that she'd try to have her recommitted. So she moved in with Boone, a patient she'd met while in the crazy house. He'd seem nice enough at first, but then he went off his meds. Life got scary. But she dealt the best she could, keeping her presence hidden, head down and mouth shut, because lack of options. Living with Boone was like living with Carrie's mother or Norman Bates, depending on which of his personalities stepped out of bed in the morning. Of course, she should have known better than to room with someone she'd met in a psychiatric ward. Not the brightest decision she'd ever made. Mostly, she kept to herself behind a locked bedroom door, only venturing out to go to work or forage for food like a field mouse. Oftentimes, she'd bring home a slice of pecan pie and pork chop, or some meatloaf from Roxy's, but she always ate in her car, because the one time she'd brought home leftovers, Boone took it from her before scoffing it down like a wild dog. A few months later, she heard Vicky's voice, and being that Amy's life was a living hell right then, 
Vicky's presence was a welcome reprieve. Amy knew better than to speak to her aloud, for fear of being locked up again. So she spoke to Vicky silently, in her head. It was great having her friend back, but Vicky didn't rekindle their friendship to talk girl stuff or catch up on old times. Vicky had a mission. Amy was to save Shane's ass from a drunken brawl, a fight he picked with a dozen or two beefy, burly, and drunk men at a local dive bar just outside town. Amy had drove the 20 minutes to Runwich, one town over from Buckeye. If Buckeye was a hole-in-the-wall town, then Runwich was a chip in the paint of that same wall. A person would have a hard time finding a stop sign in Runwich that wasn't riddled with silvery bullet holes. Because of Vicky, Amy had found a safe place to live, and Shane had found someone to watch his brother while he went off to war in the Middle East. But sometimes Amy wondered if Vicky, from beyond the grave, was playing matchmaker. The first time Amy went to Vicky's house, Amy was only 12. Vicky was 10. They had met at school and immediately hit it off. Vicky and Amy were both outsiders, shunned by the other kids, though at the time, neither knew why. Looking back on it, Amy could admit Vicky and her were a bit off. They were both superstitious as heck. Both preferred figurines modeled after wizards, elves, and warriors, as opposed to dolls or stuffed animals. They were best friends, as corny as that sounded. Vicky got Amy. She really got her. Which was why Vicky knew the moment Amy laid eyes on Shane, Amy was infatuated. But Shane had never felt the same. Amy was always the little girl that played with his kid sister. Her spark that burned for Shane dimmed over the years, but never extinguished. Amy dated other guys, sure, but nothing ever took. Now, here she was, 19 years old, living in Shane's house. They weren't the romantic couple she'd always hoped for, but they were friends. And that was almost as good. Almost. Four months into his tour, she'd gotten a call at three in the morning. His voice was hoarse and faded in and out. Hey, babe. God, your voice sounds good. Can't talk for... You there? She scooted her back up the headboard. Shane's t-shirt, she oftentimes wore as a nighty, rode up her legs. She waited, but the line went dead. Her arm dropped, hanging over the side of the bed. The phone slipped from her limp fingers. A mournful thud echoed in the dark and lonely room. With the heels of her hands, she covered her sleep-weary eyes. She said to the empty bedroom, Be safe. Then she'd scrambled out of bed, making her way to the kitchen. She flicked on the light overlooking the small dining table. Immediately, she began penning a letter. You just called and we got disconnected. I sit here in an oversized shirt of yours. I hope you don't mind that I raided your bureau. It's just, sometimes I get depressed. Scooter's great and all, but he's not always home. Either at school or out of friends. And sometimes I can't help but feel lonely. Pathetic, I know. Sorry. And wearing your shirt, smelling you on the soft, worn fabric, makes the loneliness not so unbearable. I hope that doesn't creep you out. Anyway, it's three in the morning. I can't sleep. I know you're okay. I don't know how I know, but I know. At the same time, I can't help worrying. I want to tell you again how grateful I am to be living here with Scooter. We're getting along famously. 
He's a great kid. And he's super bright, too. Can I send you anything? Reminders of home? I'm including a copy of Scooter's science paper on how to make batteries from fruits and vegetables. I'm sure you'll find it riveting. <laughs> I'm also including baby wipes, sunglass goggles, playing cards, socks, and underwear. Hope you like boxers. That's what my daddy always wore. Speaking of daddy, I saw him last night. I was burning some acacia oil and suddenly the candle flame turned blue, then blew out. So of course I knew a spirit was nearby. After checking the house and finding nothing, I checked the yard. It was just a dark shadow hovering near that big weeping willow, but I know it was him. I'm so glad he found me here. I haven't seen him since before I was admitted to the psych ward. <sighs> I'm rambling. Sorry. Not sure what to say here. Probably shouldn't talk about seeing my dead father. Now you'll think I'm creepy and crazy. Guess I just want you to know the real me. I'm thinking of you and praying for a speedy and safe return. Amy. Three weeks later, she got a letter. Hey, babe. Boxers are great. Scooter Science paper was good, too, but I gotta say I didn't actually read it. And you wearing my clothes is not creepy. It's sexy as hell. Glad my scent helps with the loneliness. For whatever it's worth, I'd kill for a whiff of your scent. Definitely help with my loneliness. Tough day. One of the fellows got a letter from his woman. The bitch is leaving him for somebody else. But that's not what made the day shitty. The shitty part was how he reacted. He went nuts. Let's just say it took four of us to restrain him. Felt almost wrong getting your letter and goodies after what Dennis had got. A swift kick in the nuts by the lion skank bitch he was crazy for. Sorry. Like I said, tough day. Keep writing. Tell me about you and Scooter. It's what I want to hear. Give me some normal in this hellhole. Make me remember what I'm fighting for. So yes, I want to hear about how you'd rather vacation in the mountains than at the beach. But the color green sometimes makes you sneeze. And how you can't seem to find a brand of fire ant killer that actually works. Tell me everything. Everything. Please. Even the so-called crazy parts. But I want you to know something, babe. I don't think you're crazy. I think you're eccentric and wild and very pretty. But not crazy. Glad you saw your dad. I know you loved him a bunch. You must miss him. I'll tell you one thing. I miss you. A lot. Shane. With her next letter, Amy sent one of her tank tops, making sure it was covered in her allure perfume. Sweet, but not to where it made one nauseated, she hoped. Shane had said he loved her sweet-smelling tank. Carmen gave her crap, saying Amy should have sent a pair of her panties. But Carmen had misunderstood. Amy and Shane were just friends. Yes, he flirted in his letters, but that was just his way. Shane flirted with everybody. At least everybody who was female. Over the years before she was admitted to the crazy house... She'd cried herself to sleep way too many times, and all because she'd run into him at the grocery store. He'd proceed to flirt with her like crazy, and she'd get her hopes up. Maybe he liked her. Like a guy was supposed to like a gal. But after some small talk, he'd mention his girlfriend slash current fuck buddy. Sometimes he had several girlfriends slash fuck buddies. Never again would she misinterpret Shane's flirting. Never again. They were friends and that's all they'd ever be. More letters followed. And now a year later, Shane would finally be home from the desert. 
Just a few more days. Strange. She wasn't expecting anyone. Carmen, her best friend, was at the Raising Hell party at the Rising Bowl, their small town's rendition of a nightclub. Scooter was at his friend Zach's house over on Goth Road. Was it possible that a real-life trick-or-treater had come to the trailer this year? Just feet from the front door, Amy reached for the handle, but before she made contact, the knob turned, and the door squeaked open. A dry October breeze raked across her neck and bare arms. A figure filled the threshold. Tattered jeans, red flannel shirt reeking of motor oil, black scuffed-up combat boots. To complete the Mr. Psycho ensemble, the person donned a cheesy zombie mask. A large plastic pumpkin was gripped in a rawhide-gloved hand. The gloves stained with dark splotches. Only a large butcher knife jutted from the jack-o'-lantern's opening, blade pointing up, splattered in... blood? The figure lifted a hand and waggled his fingers in a hello gesture. What a creep. A li- a little old to be... to be trick-or-treating, huh? Mr. Psycho said nothing, just lifted his pumpkin, jiggled it. The knife rattled in the hollow plastic container. The rubber zombie mask showcased a permanent visceral scowl, but Amy suspected that beneath it, the person sported a big ol' ear to rotten ear Texas grin. This was probably just some frat guy from the Muskegon campus over in Sagor who thought it'd be a hoot to give a good scare. To a girl, all alone, in the sticks. Just... Just one second. Moment. She turned and hurried into the kitchen, looking to get this frat zombie or whoever the hell he was his candy and get him off her doorstep. He was probably silently having a good laugh at her expense. On the one day of the year when frightening the living wasn't a deviant act committed solely by the criminally insane. She couldn't stop trembling, shaking like a damn moth on an anthill. Was that a real knife? It sure didn't look like a plastic prop and the way it had clanked around in that bucket. What if he wasn't some frat guy? The thought made her knees buckle. What if he was drunk? Or high? Had he escaped from Edengate Sanitarium? A ridiculously frightening thought. Edengate didn't house people afflicted with depression, anxiety, or even those who had attempted suicide. Edengate only housed the most serious crazies. People that were not just dangerous to themselves but lethal to any they encounter. She'd read a story in the Buckeye Leader where Edengate had put one of their patients on a bus headed for Fort Worth, but the patient had gotten off prematurely at an ice cream parlor. He brutally attacked a young mother and her preteen child. She knew she wasn't overreacting. Crazy things like that did happen, and she wasn't about to forget that this was Buckeye, where crazy things from all over came to hide in the woods, ponds, attics and to lurk in the back roads, like those chainsaw-wielding maniacs from the old movies. That's to say nothing of escapee patients from Edengate. Everyone still remembered the Vallis Farm murders from the 80s. Focus. She used one hand to form a basket with the slack of her tank, and the other hand to scoop candy into it. One second. Milky Ways. Butterfingers a large skull-shaped jawbreaker that she hoped he'd choke on. How would this jerk found her anyhow? The trailer was eight miles from the nearest city streetlight. The closest neighbor was a half mile away and that was Abe. No way he'd pull a stunt like this. The front door slammed. All the candy bundled in her tank spilled onto the floor. She whirled to find the large zombie shambling toward her. She held up a finger. Wait outside. Please. He held the orange bucket in front, his gait and posture more like Frankenstein's monster than living dead. She backed herself into the breakfast bar. The zombie shook his head. He dropped his pumpkin. The thud of the hollowed plastic on the wood floor stirred a swarm of hornets in her gut. 
She gagged back the bile crawling up her throat. My boyfriend will be home any second, I swear. Through the slits of his cheesy mask, the zombie stared at her. Cold. Dead. He's seven feet tall and, and, and over 300... 360 pounds. The corny mask continued staring at her. Did I mention he'll be home any second? He just called. Y you should leave. An act of futility to keep her voice even and steady. The zombie peeled the mask over his head, revealing the human beneath. Shane. She palmed her chest, heartbeats kicking at her ribcage. Relief flashed to anger. Amy straightened and glared, rushing up to him. With a flat hand, she slapped at his chest. Jerk. He grabbed her wrists, one in each of his hands. What boyfriend? Good gravy. Her heart felt as if it might burst from her chest, and the hornets in her stomach were still frenzied. She eyed the grip he had on her wrists. Her glare moved to his sun-tanned face in eight o'clock shadow. You said you wouldn't be home for a few days. What boyfriend? She thrust her arms down, ripping herself from his grip. Or at least, that was the plan, but he held her firm. What boyfriend? What was I supposed to say? I thought you were a bad guy. Again, she eyed his hold on her wrists. He blinked as if he'd forgotten he had her in his grasp. Shane released her. I am a bad guy. Realization hit her like a dunk in a cold lake. She wrapped her arms around his neck, a fierce hug. With her head tucked beside his, she brushed her hand over his buzz cut and palmed the back of his neck. His arms coiled around to the small of her back. He pulled her tight against him, very tight. She cleared her throat and stepped out of the hug. Walking backward, she led him to the sofa. Amy sat and pulled him onto the cushion beside her. Tell me everything. Before he got a word out, her eyes widened. Amy covered her mouth and slapped her thigh. Wish I'd known you were coming home early. I'd have cooked your favorite. He shrugged. Surprise. Amy's face scrunched. Well, dang. I don't even know what your favorite meal is. I should know. She was rambling, and in a nervous sort of way, Shane thought. And he loved it. When she'd pulled him in for a hug, the scent of her hair, the sun on her skin, the feel of her soft yet firm breasts pressed against him was incredible. God bless home. God bless Texas. God bless Amy. And God bless breasts. Why don't I know? I should have asked. Why haven't I asked? In one of my letters I should have asked. Shane hid a smile. What was his favorite thing to eat? He thought for a moment. Only one delicious word came to mind. And it was a juicy, sweet, and tangy word. Pussy. But Amy wouldn't have served pussy for dinner. They were just friends. And friends don't spread their legs for other friends. So what else did he want to eat? He frowned, thinking. Racked his travel-weary head. Nope. He just wanted pussy. Laura was a fairly sure thing, just as long as her on-off boyfriend was currently set to the off position. Tammy was a definite. Maybe. But she was a bit of a skank and there was a good possibility she had contracted one or more diseases. Or even cultivated a brand new strain since the last time they'd bumped uglies. Reese was gorgeous and crazy fun in bed. Or on the dryer, kitchen table, or in the tub. But there was always that one little thing between them. The fact that she was a crack dealer. And he was a reformed junkie. No way in hell he'd ever go back to that nightmarish merry-go-round. Guess he'd just be hitting the ball. 
On the way home, he'd seen the Halloween get-up that Mike had put on the front corral gates. A column of human skulls rimming the gate and fake green glow-in-the-dark spider webs on the head of Sikkim over the archway. Maybe he'd catch Carmen there and she could help set him up. Maybe if Carr was drunk enough, he could just repropose that friends with benefits policy. Maybe she still did X. Even better. Shane felt something rub against his leg. He looked down to find a black as night cat slinking around in between his calves. Amy let out a small, girlish, cute as hell giggle. I almost forgot. This is Freya. She adopted me about a week ago. I hope you like her. I told her she could stay. Want to know something weird? Hell yeah. Go for it, baby. Something familiar about her. Not like a little familiar, but really familiar. I know it sounds crazy, but I swear I've met Freya. In a past life, maybe. Shane cupped her chin. You ain't crazy. Amy blushed. She eyed him. Scoffing, he removed his hand from her chin. How long had you been planning this? Surprising me with an early return home and costumed as a madman. He snickered, flashing his best interpretation of a roguish smile. Initially, he hadn't planned anything more than surprising her with his presence. After Birch picked him up at the airport, Birch was supposed to just drive him home. But when Shane saw the flickering sign next to Dot's Pond that was advertising discounted costumes, in a moment of genius, he concocted this scheme. Shane paid the guy for the mask, knife, pumpkin, and other accoutrements, and walked out of the place with a rich swagger and a wide grin. Toying with Amy and her superstitious beliefs was too irresistible to pass up. The thrill of the anticipation. The look on her pretty face should have been boner worthy. It should have been fun as hell. And it had been. Until she said she had a boyfriend. Not only that, but she was going to sick the motherfucker on him like her personal junkyard dog. It wasn't fun anymore. Okay, she didn't really have a boyfriend. So why was his blood boiling hotter than the desert sands? And why did he want to punch a hole through the wall? Possibly burn something down? And why did he care if she had a boyfriend? Her head cocked, she studied him. What is it? Long blonde hair pulled into a ponytail. Sun-baked copper skin. Purple tank. White cotton shorts. Bare feet. Blue painted toenails. Girl next door to a tee. Not his type. He liked his women hot, wild, and willing. Too much rouge on the cheeks and too much booze in the veins. The trashier, the sexier. But sitting here now, he fought an incredible urge to kiss Amy Ray Wintry. What would she taste like? Shane crooked a finger, motioning her closer. Amy's eyes widened in question. She looked over her shoulder as if he were talking to someone behind her. Shane crooked his finger again. Slowly, she leaned forward. Her lips parted. Shane inched closer. Until he scented... What? On her breath. He inhaled again. A shallow intake of air made Amy gasp, visibly shudder. A subtle, fruity, sweet fragrance emanated from her parted pink lips. Your breath. It smells... sweet. Their faces almost touching. Lips almost touching. She moaned something indiscernible. 
What have you had in your pretty mouth? She swallowed. Shane watched a small lump slide down the slender column of her neck. His gaze moved to her face. Her lips. Babe? She blinked. Oh, I had a glass of strawberry wine, just a little. Strawberry? She nodded. He had to taste it. Shane put his lips to hers. Just a gentle brush of his mouth. He waited. Amy waited. Eyes closed. She hadn't slapped him or pulled back. Shane leaned in again. A slow swipe of his tongue along her parted lips. Definitely strawberry. Amy jerked away. She stood from the couch and ran her palms down her thighs. Both hands lifted to tuck her hair behind her ears. Smiling tightly, she turned toward the kitchen and started walking. You must be famished. I'm sure I could whip something up. I'll take some meat out of the freezer for tomorrow, then we'll... Shane jumped up, sprinted after her. Coming from behind, he wrapped his arms around her waist. Hands laced across her abdomen. Face pressed against the nape of her neck. He kissed her soft, warm skin and relished the faint taste of her sweat and girlish musk. I love strawberry. Shane. Her body stilled in his embrace. What? He waited. But she never finished her question. So he proceeded to nibble at her fleshy little earlobe. His hand swept down the front of her tank, coming to a neat and gentle rest over the crotch of her shorts. Do you taste like strawberry? He cupped his hand over her groin, fingers curling. Wetness soaked through the cotton. She was wet for him. His mouth against her nape, he moaned. Do you taste like strawberry down? He wiggled his fingers, feeling the folds of her sex beneath the thin fabric. Here? I don't know. Shane held her tighter her ass snug against the bulge in his jeans. The erotic sensation was strange yet hot as hell. He'd never thought of Amy as anything but a good friend. A very good friend. But holding her now, touching her, feeling the dampness at her sex, smelling the fruity shampoo in her beautiful long hair, he felt a crazy passion he'd never felt before. Maybe he was just insanely horny, what with being in the desert for the past year and nothing more than his right hand to comfort him. But he didn't think so. Amy was his friend. She was a woman. And a friend. But still a woman. Shane moved his hand from her groin. His palms cupped her small, wonderful breasts. This was different. This was Amy. She was his friend. Holy fuck, he wanted her. He would take this slow, rubbing her until her pussy lips foamed good and wet. He'd wash his face in her suds. Lick her. Eat her. She'd be walking bow-legged tomorrow. Shane's body shuddered with anticipation.
he had touched Brassy and Sassy. Was this really happening? Shane wanted her. This was what she'd dreamed of her whole life. The nerdy girl was finally getting a shot at the football stud. Amy's whole body hummed with a special kind of anxiety that made her want to screech like a damn banshee. His husky voice. Warm breath on her prickled skin loosened her rigid posture. Why now? Why was Shane suddenly seeing her as a woman? Dare she think it, a lover. He'd been in the desert for the past year, she scolded herself. Probably to have sex with a porcupine right now. She felt his lips on her neck again. Her body tensed in his grasp. You never once thought about it? Shane was a player, a real womanizer. But she could admit that the idea of sleeping with him had been the stirring act of most of her erotic dreams since damn near puberty. The scent of beer wafted from his breath. Well, I'm thinking about it. Right now. They'd become close the last year, no doubt. She'd thought about it many times. But Amy assumed he'd always see her as that little girl that used to play with his sister. And yet, she'd fantasized about this moment since forever. Babe. This'll change everything. Fuck, I hope so. She allowed herself to relax into him. Scooter? Out of friends. Shane slipped the strap of the tank off her shoulder. He feathered kisses along her nape. His arms loosened around her abdomen. Hands palmed her flat stomach. Her body, from her ankles to her eyelashes, tingled. She closed her eyes, picturing his expert hands moving south. Back to her damp sex. His mouth on her neck felt so darn good. She heard herself moan, a husky sound she didn't recognize. And in that moment, she realized she'd gladly be his fuck buddy. She'd rather be his slut than anybody else's one and only. She'd take Shane any way she could get him. Every which way she could get him. An erotic hum coiled in and around her sex. The muscles in her stomach quivered and tightened. If only he would touch her. Again. There. He turned her in his arms until she faced him. Palms on her cheeks, he thrust his tongue inside her mouth. A passionate, desperate kiss. She was about to make love. For the very first time. A significant shiver of apprehension. Goosebumps riddled her scalp. Amy punched at his shoulders, but he didn't budge. She turned her head. Wait. A slow, devious smile. Not possible. I've never... Me neither. I never thought, he smiled down at her, of us, like this. He gave her a hard kiss, but it feels so right. Another kiss, so fucking right. She nodded, 
loving the feel of his mouth, his tongue searching for hers, his hands on her body. I mean, I've never... What I mean is that I don't taste like strawberry. I taste like cherry. Yeah? His lips trailed kisses across her cheek. He suckled the skin beneath her lobe. Yeah. She palmed the back of his head, resting her hand on his neck. Grabbing the collar of his tee, she yanked him backward. Amy eyed him. Cherry. A look of question on his scruffy face. Cherry? She nodded. As in, Cherry? She nodded. Tell me you're kidding. Amy shook her head. Shane stepped backward. He ran a hand over his head. He waved her off. Why? Because I was about to eat you alive, and now... His head hung, focus on the floor. I just need a sec. Shane leaned his back against the linen closet, fingers flexed on his jean-clad thighs. He sighed. A long, slow hiss. She stepped toward him. Ignoring his shaking head, she reveled in the erotic burn humming from between her legs, the white-hot need clutching her abdomen. I want to. No, you don't. Casually, she pulled her tank over her head and dropped it. Reaching behind, she unclasped her black bra. She twirled it around her forefinger. The yellow googly eyes centered on the lace of each cup seemed to wink at her. She let the Halloween novelty bra slip from her fingers and float to the floor. Yes, I do. He laughed, a bitter sound. I haven't fucked in a year. We start this. You bet that sweet ass you're gonna finish it. Nice. Romantic. She stared at him. He stared at her. Sighing, she picked up her tank and held it over her naked breasts. Maybe this wasn't such a good idea. Shane grabbed her upper arms. He pushed her against the wall pinning her with his body. He brought his face close, his lips a breath from hers. He hesitated. Whatever it is you're offering, I want it. I want you. The good, the bad, and everything in between. I don't care what you've done, who you've done or who you've hurt. I know you, and I still want you. I've always wanted you. Amy grimaced. Damn you, what do I have? Shane kissed her. Slow, wet, sweet. You're quirky and crazy and sweet and sexy as hell. I love talking to you, touching you smelling you. With his nose, he tickled her neck. I've never felt like this for anyone. Amy blinked. What? How? Her legs wobbled. The air in her lungs rushed from her. Shane? I want to be your first. Tears slipped down her face. He tugged at the tank in her grasp. It floated to the floor, bearing herself to him. I've never said this to another human being, much less a woman. I think I love you. I love you? Had he really just said that? Yep, he did. And that wasn't the scary part. The scary part was that he actually meant it. War must have fucked with his head. He wasn't the same man he was when he left. Watching two friends die could do that to a person, he supposed. This life here seemed surreal compared to the raw and gritty hatred that faced him on the daily in the desert. 
He'd only been home a matter of hours, but he already felt hugely out of his element. He was a fish flopping on the shore, panting for breath. In the car on the way home, Birch had complained about Bridget's obsession with shopping. The credit card bills were just about maxed out. Birch could barely keep up with the minimum payments. Surreal indeed. It was Halloween. What an absurd and silly holiday. Get dressed up and beg for candy. This world was cartoonish compared to the illogical hatred he faced on the other side of the planet. War changed a man. It changed him. For the better, he hoped. Forty hours ago, he'd boarded a plane for the States. The plan was to get blackout drunk and fuck like it was the eve of the apocalypse. But here, he held his sweet Amy. In this moment of complete vulnerability, the urge to confess his sin shadowed the urge to make love. He should tell her that he was being brought up on charges. There was a strong chance he'd end up in the stockade. When he came forward and lied, saying he was the one that had beat the captain near death, he thought he was doing his friend a favor. The guy wasn't in his right mind, still reeling over his ex leaving him. Dennis just needed time to pull himself together. At the time, Shane had nothing to lose. Sure, there was Scooter, but Amy was taking good care of him. And truth be told, she made a better parent than Shane ever did or could. Amy splayed her soft hands on his cheeks. She smiled. I love you too. Fuck vulnerability. Fuck confessing sins. With any luck, there'd be nothing to tell. Maybe it'd all blow over. If only he believed that. If the captain died, Shane would be going away for a long time, if not executed. Best case, the captain wakes up and tells everyone Shane wasn't the one who'd beat on him. He'd be dishonorably discharged for lying under oath. Either way, he was fucked. But if it was the latter, at least he could come home permanently. To Amy. Shane scooped her into his arms, an arm under her back and an arm under her legs. Silently, he carried her to his bedroom. Or rather, what used to be his bedroom. The white walls had been painted navy. A white floral pattern had been stenciled at the top. The pattern stretched the length of each of his four walls. The plastic fishing tub he'd been using for a lampstand beside his bed was gone, replaced by an oak end table. Its twin was on the other side of the bed. Matching lamps sat atop the end tables. Two horses cast in rustic copper circled the column of each lamp. Shades also made of copper glimmered in the beam of moonlight streaming through the window blind. He had blinds? Shane paused beside his bed. Cradling her in his arms, he kissed her nose. He set her down with her legs draped over the foot of the mattress. Shane set her bare feet on his shoulders. He reached under and slid her cotton shorts down the length of her legs. White whiskers with a curious cat smile was stitched on the silk of her black panties. He hooked his fingers beneath the silk and tugged the panties down her legs. Amy was naked. She bent her knees and curled her legs to the side, inching backward across the... Comforter? He had a comforter? Camouflage. Where was his holy, ragged blanket? Who the fuck cared? In the dim moonlight, he could see one arm was bent, covering her breasts. Her legs bent and crossed at the ankles hiding her sex. Did she really want to do this? Shane flicked the bedside lamp on. When his gaze met hers, a blush colored her tan, smiling face. She wanted it all right. Amy was just not used to exposing herself. 
to anybody. Lay back. Put your arms by your side. Legs straight. Thighs spread. Amy swallowed. She slid her arms to the side, lay flat and opened her legs. Her rib cage expanded with shallow, quick breaths. He gazed down at her neatly trimmed sex, a slim line of hair on each beautiful lip. You have a very pretty pussy. The compliment was meant to relax her, but it seemed to do the opposite. Sweat beaded on her forehead. She was either really excited or really scared. You could tell she struggled with the impulse to cover herself. Over the crotch of his jeans, Shane repositioned his straining, hard dick. You want this? She nodded. You sure? She nodded. He grabbed her calves and bent her legs at the knees. Gently, he glided his hand along her inner thigh and spread her open. Prove it. Touch yourself. This was the most erotic and wonderfully awkward moment of her life. So deliciously awkward. She slid her palm down her belly. One finger circled her sensitive inflamed nub. Was she really touching herself in front of a man? And not just any man, but Shane. A man she's been in love with since forever? Oh, gosh. She was dripping all over the new comforter. But she didn't care. That's why washing machines were invented. Why in the hell was she thinking about washing machines now? The feel of his hot gaze on her naked body embarrassed her, but in a very erotic, exciting way. Sort of like being totally, happily sad. Yes, it made no sense, but how else to describe it? Put your finger inside your pussy. He spoke as if asking for creamer for his coffee. If only her heart would stop climbing her damn throat. Her finger slid down her slit and into her wet sex. Shane watched as she touched herself. His expression was placid, yet she sensed he was even more turned on than she, if that was possible. T two he stuttered. She smiled, happy in the knowledge that she could have this kind of effect on him. As long as she'd known him, Shane had always been a bit of a loose cannon, struggling with his temper and reacting too quickly to tough situations. But through it all, she always thought of him as a solid person. He knew his mind, he knew his heart, and he owned who he was, the good and bad. She admired that about him. In Amy's mind, he was solid as steel. And she had made that steel quiver. A delicious thought indeed. Amy did as he asked and used two fingers to touch herself. In. Out. Around and along her slit. Her clit. Heck. She'd put a watermelon inside her if he asked. This moment was so much better. Hotter than she ever imagined possible. Either that or she was the sluttiest, horniest virgin on God's green earth. That's it, baby. He crawled toward her. Flat on his stomach, he used his head to nudge her hand from her sex. Wet. Hot. Lips covered her drenched sex, suckling. Using the broad side of his tongue, he licked. Long, slow swipes. His arms hooked under her thighs, pulling her into him. Ravishly, he ate. And ate. And ate. Crazed, furious licking and nibbling. 
Shane seemed overcome with lust, aggressive, unbridled. A subtle nervousness dampened her own lust. Something must have given her away because suddenly he slowed. His wicked lips moved to the sensitive nub, circling, licking, a finger pressed inside her, and another. Climax rolled, a tsunami of pleasure, riddling, consuming every pore of her skin. Heels pushing into the mattress, she arched her back, Trembling waves of orgasm, abrupt jerks seized her body. Seemingly ignorant of her erotic distress, Shane continued eating, suckling every bit of juice oozing from her sex. As the erotic jolts faded, Amy felt herself relax. Her eyes closed. She could sleep for a week. Beneath her, the mattress moved. She opened her eyes to find Shane crawling up her body. He positioned himself between her legs, cock nudging at her opening. Hands braced on either side of her body. Arms straight, elbows locked. He looked down at her. Amy thought he might say something, but he didn't. Just do it, she thought. Gripping his cock at the base, she slid the tip along her slit. And down. The head pushed. Painfully, inside her, just a little, just the tip. Her hands flew to his broad chest, palming his pecs. Wait. He scowled. Amy rolled from beneath him. She scooted from the bed and dashed to the corner of the room. She grabbed her sneakers and rushed back, positioning her shoes toe-to-toe beneath the bed. Shane patted the mattress. Get that sweet ass back here. Giggling, she hopped on the bed. He rolled on top of her, repositioning himself at her core. What the hell was that all about? Just something my aunt told me. I'll explain later. Now. It's supposed to help me... Um... Um, what? me. Climax. Baby, this is gonna hurt like fuck. You ain't gonna come. He curled a finger beneath her chin. He frowned. Okay? Amy nodded, knowing he was full of crap. She would definitely climax. Her aunt said so, and so did Amy's instincts. And if Amy learned anything from her aunt, besides the toe-to-toe shoe trick, it was to trust her own instincts do it. Posture rigid, chin high. She was so ready. One hard thrust. A streak of white hot pain sliced up her insides, shivering up her chest, stinging the back of her throat. Tears sprung from her eyes. Shane stilled. Amy breathed. She pictured the walls of her insides relaxing mind over matter. She imagined that elusive G-spot, Shane's cock pushing deeper, tickling that sensitive erotic zone. Her legs came around his waist, ankles crossed over the top of his wonderful ass. She tucked her arms beneath his and slid her palms down his muscular back. Shane moaned, a deep, throaty sound. He rotated his hips, small, subtle movements against her core rubbing her just the right way. 
Oh, from somewhere deep. Oh, oh, so deep. Inside her, an orgasm rolled. Amy smiled, whispering a silent thank you to Aunt Carol. <laughs>